With a look at a side of horse racing that's seldom seen, Central Lobby comes under starter's orders at 10.35. Now, though, news from ITN. Mrs. Thatcher condemns poll tax violence, so does Mr. Kinnock. Police clash with poll tax demonstrators in Hackney tonight. Mr. Ridley under fire from both sides over the Harrods sale. West Germany agrees to respect Poland's present borders. And Mr. Patton refuses to sign a North Sea nuclear dumping ban. Good evening. There has been more violence during demonstrations against the poll tax tonight, hours after Mrs. Thatcher and Mr. Kinnock both condemned illegal forms of protest. Police in Hackney in London clashed with protesters outside a barricaded town hall. 38 people have been arrested and there have been running street battles. Demonstrators in Swindon and Wiltshire tried to break into council offices. The Prime Minister told MPs anti-poll tax violence was the same as Grunwick, coal strike and whopping violence and MPs should not encourage people not to pay. The opposition leader, Mr Kinnock, told her, I agree with everything you have said. Our political editor, Michael Brunson, has the first of three reports on the latest rows over the poll tax. The government, in the shape of ministers assembling for cabinet this morning, is paying relatively little heed to the anti-poll tax demonstrations. Time spent on them this morning was very brief. And Mrs Thatcher's attitude this afternoon was, we've seen this sort of thing before. They are precisely the same kind of violence we've seen before at Grunwick, in the coal strike and at Wapping, and they're the negation of democracy. Earlier she criticised the present violence. People would show their, pursue their protest peacefully and in accordance with the democratic process. And I believe also it is quite wrong for any honourable members to suggest that people should disobey the law in not paying their... Yeah. Yeah. Who, before asking about something else, said... May I first of all agree with everything that the Prime Minister just said, as I've very long made very clear. Slightly flawed, Mrs Thatcher's response to that was part of a later answer. I have not, however, answered the right honourable gentleman's first comment when he rose at that dispatch box, that he agreed with me fully about condemning the militants. The Labour MPs were annoyed because they knew Mr Kinnock, having already asked three questions, couldn't really reply. Will he also, therefore, condemn the 28 me Labour members of Parliament who are urging that people should yeah. not... The question's a sensitive one after Mr Ben's suggestion tonight of a huge civil disobedience campaign. I would never tell anyone to break the law, but I pledge my 100% support for those who on moral principles or out of poverty will not or cannot pay a tax which is utterly wicked and unfair and is designed to destroy local democracy in this country. The Tory party chairman's been having his say too, producing charts and figures to support his claim that the poll tax is identifying Labour high spending as the real problem. Labour though won't have it. Mr Baker, who was so desperately panicked because of the huge adverse reaction nationwide to the poll tax, is now trying to fiddle the figures and use bogus averaging uh, to try to support his hopelessly uh, undermined government's position on the poll tax. We have no paid your poll tax! We have no paid your poll tax! Tonight, Mrs Thatcher is in Scotland, where supporters of the non-payment campaign held a demonstration as she arrived to make a speech in Glasgow. The Prime Minister has used that speech to launch another sharp attack on Labour's alternative to the poll tax. What she called Labour's roof tax was a nightmare. Labour, she said, wanted to tax, tax and tax again. Michael Brunson, News at 10, Westminster. There were more than a thousand people outside the town hall in Hackney as councillors pushed their way through for their meeting. It wasn't long before youths at the front clashed with police. The crowd became more and more impatient. Eggs, bottles and beer cans were thrown before more serious violence broke out.
There were more than 20 arrests as the crowds moved into streets around the council building. An ambulance had difficulty reaching the scene, at least one policeman and several demonstrators were injured. Cars and police vehicles were damaged by bricks and bottles, and as snatch squads moved in to make arrests, there was the worst violence of the night as protesters clashed with lines of police. The meeting to fix the poll tax charge continued despite the scenes outside. Liberal Democrat leader Paddy Ashdown, there for another meeting, witnessed the violence. This has been set up here for months. Uh, I was asked whether I'd have a closed meeting and I said no, I'm not prepared to let violence and intimidation cause me to prevent a meeting from being open to the public. The protesters were asked to go home. Most were reluctant to do so. Now the crowds are starting to drift away. The police will maintain a strong presence through the night. Malcolm Munro, News at 10, the borough of Hackney. Last week, demonstrators forced their way into the council chambers here. Tonight, they tried again. Police, in greater numbers than last week, managed to hold them back, but only after a struggle. So things getting a little lively here, a small group, and I stress small group of young people trying to force their way through the doors. The large majority of the people here, though, simply standing and watching. The group of 30 or 40 protesters launched a second, a third, then a fourth push. But there was no fighting as such. At the height of the scrum, one constable said, a protester told him, it's nothing personal, Gov. And later, he returned his helmet. The group police said they were local lads eventually gave up and set fire to an effigy of Mrs Thatcher hanging from a balcony. That seemed to please the thousand or so people here more than the attempts to enter the building. Hopes were expressed that like the effigy, Mrs Thatcher would soon come down to earth about the poll tax. Vernon Mann News at 10, Swindon. The Trade Secretary, Mr Nicholas Ridley, came under fierce attack tonight from his own backbench MPs over his refusal to intervene in the Harrods affair. Earlier, the government had been condemned by the Labour leader, Mr Kinnock. The decision to take no action over the Harrods affair, despite a damning report which said the Fayed brothers lied repeatedly in winning approval for the takeover, has deeply angered many Conservatives as well as Labour MPs. And today in the Commons, the pressure intensified, first in Prime Minister's question well, time. Prime Minister tell us why her government thinks it would not be in the public interest to use its powers to seek the disqualification of the proven liars who now head the House of Fraser. Yeah. Yeah. Mrs Thatcher blocked that question by simply referring back to yesterday's uh, statement from Mr Ridley. Friend, as my right honourable friend indicated yesterday, he has answered the, the questions in full and I must rest upon them. But some Conservatives made plain their anger as they questioned leader of the House, Sir Geoffrey Howe. If we can debate for six hours the conduct of one member, why can't we spare three hours to, to talk about the conduct of these discreditable and loathsome people? The chairman of the Select Committee on Trade and Industry, Kenneth Warren, joined the demands for a full debate. There's no sign of any change of heart on the part of Trade Secretary Nicholas Ridley or the government. He's the minister who is bearing the brunt of this attack. And tonight in the Commons, in a private meeting of Conservative backbenchers, there were renewed and fierce calls, first for a debate, second for action against the Fayads themselves. The issue dominated the meeting. The anger over the El Fayad affair comes from a large number of Conservatives, some of them senior members of the party. Mr Ridley and the government are both under intense pressure. It seems at the least there'll have to be a full debate in the Commons. Peter Allen, News at 10, Westminster. The West German Parliament has assured Poland that a united Germany will respect its existing borders. In Brussels, Chancellor Kohl told his NATO allies the same thing. But President Jaruzelski of Poland said the latest German promises were not fully satisfactory because they weren't specific enough. Earlier, Herr Kohl was labelled a political risk by the opposition in the Bundestag over his whole handling of reunification. Chancellor Cole knew he was in for a roasting even before this debate. He busied himself ripping up old order papers while his opponents sharpened their knives. The opposition Social Democrats tore into Cole, Mr. Fergal demanding why he dragged up the whole question of wartime reparations now. He called Cole a political risk factor. And Cole's under attack from within. 
His own foreign minister, Genscher, today dismissed Cole's ambiguities. Increasingly, it's Genscher who's commanding confidence with his more sensitive handling of the German question. So, on a determined damage control exercise, the Bundestag today made history, voting full acceptance of Poland's post-war borders. Some 12 million modern West Germans came from the old German territories east of the River Oder. These lands were lost along with the war. As long as Kohl clung to the legal technicality that only a united Germany could deal with this, he alarmed not only Germany's neighbours, but many Germans too. East German Prime Minister Modrow has been a stern critic. Chancellor Kohl's clumsy handling of the German question has damaged the unification process. It's raised fears on both sides of wartime reparations and property claims. It's probably responsible for the tougher Soviet stand on German neutrality. And today, West Germans themselves decided it had to stop. Ian Glover-James, News at 10 in Berlin. Chancellor Kohl was meeting NATO leaders in Brussels for talks on the effect a united Germany will have on the military balance in Europe. A report from our diplomatic editor, Edward Sturton. Chancellor Kohl arrived in Brussels to find that here at least his new stand on the Polish border was welcome. His task was to reassure Germany's NATO allies, especially those nations that won't be formally involved in the talks on German unification, that their interests will be remembered in the rush to one Germany. He promised a constant process of consultation with NATO nations, but afterwards he couldn't resist a swipe at those who've expressed reservations about German unification, and Mrs Thatcher is among them. It is, he pointed out, what NATO and the West have been demanding for four decades. On the future of NATO troops in a united Germany, Chancellor Kohl and the Allies are of one mind. They want them to stay. The proposal they'll put forward for the new Germany's security arrangements is likely to look something like this. At present, West Germany belongs within NATO and East Germany is a member of the Warsaw Pact. Now it'll be suggested that both halves of a united Germany should fall within NATO. But the British, American and French troops who garrison West Germany will have to stay in the West. And Soviet divisions will be able to stay in the East at least for a while, even though it would then be NATO territory. That's because the Soviets have long regarded their forces in East Germany as essential to their security. President Gorbachev has said he's opposed to NATO membership for a united Germany. Allowing Soviet troops to remain on NATO ground may be the only way of persuading him to change his mind. We are prepared to accept um, guarantees or methods which would uh, really prove to the Soviets that we take their legitimate security interests not only into account that we respect them there is a new urgency about the issues discussed today talks on unification between the two germanys the soviets and the western allies have been brought forward to next week chancellor Kohl acknowledged here that efforts to make unification an orderly process can be undermined by the pace of events edward sturton news at 10 brussels the new parliament of the Soviet Republic of Lithuania is to declare itself an independent republic at the weekend. A spokesman for the nationalist Sayukis movement, which has a majority, said it would be reaffirming the independence declaration first made in 1918. This weekend's session has been called ahead of a key meeting of the Soviet parliament on Monday, which Lithuanians fear could bring in constitutional changes to block their secession. Here, the Environment Secretary, Mr Chris Patton, has told the North Sea Countries Conference in The Hague that Britain will not sign an agreement to ban the burial of nuclear waste under the North Sea. Denmark accused Britain of playing with our lives. Mr Patton did say there were no plans for any such dumping at present. Ministers agreed on a range of measures to clean up the North Sea. Our Environment Correspondent, Justin Jones, reports. It had been a very difficult conference. All eight ministers signed the final declaration, but it was clear Britain was isolated and Mr Patton was accused of being unreasonably restricted by the British cabinet. Britain was, let us be honest, the most difficult country in the conference uh, and it should have been much better if uh, Mr Chris Patton, who is really a very good uh, environment minister, had more possibilities to move in the direction of the majority. But it seemed uh, that he had not enough support uh, from his cabinet. The main argument was Britain's refusal to sign a ban on dumping of radioactive waste at sea. Norway's minister called for a closure of the Scottish nuclear plant at Dunray. 
but Mr Patton wanted to keep Britain's options open. He saw discharges to rivers as the key issue. We've taken the lead on the most important issue, which is uh, river quality. Uh, we've got, equally with the Netherlands, the best quality rivers uh, in the European community. We're investing more in improving river quality, and I think that that will see that we do even better and have got a better record still when it comes to the next conference. That next meeting has now been brought forward to 1993 as ministers want more urgent measures to tackle marine pollution. Despite the progress made here, European ministers are angry tonight. They accuse Britain of being the one country holding back stronger measures to clean up the North Sea. Justin Jones, News at 10, The Hague. A part-time member of the Ulster Defence Regiment was shot dead by the IRA in Northern Ireland tonight. Police there confirmed they passed on information about a death threat to a Republican shot by loyalist gunman earlier, a report in part two. Also, Mr. Mellor says quality, not the highest bid, will decide who gets the new television franchises. And Brian Robson says this time he will be fit for the World Cup. That's in a couple of minutes.